So let's talk a little bit more about how long it takes for uranium to decay to thorium, or pretty much any element. And to do that, we need to talk about, act about activities and half-lives. And what a half-life is, is this just the time that it takes for the number of radioactive nuclei to decrease to half of the original number. And it's going to be kind of an exponential. It's going to look like this, just right over there, where this is the number of radioactive nuclei at any given time. That's the original number. And it's going to be an exponential that's going to depend on this sky lambda, as well as time. We could also say that you know, the number of nuclei are directly related to mass. So if you had, say, a kilogram of radioactive uro uranium, how long does it take to drop down to half of a kilogram? And it's kind of an average thing. And that's going to be the same to go from half to a quarter of a kilogram, and a quarter to 0.125, and so on and so forth. You can kind of see cutting in half, cutting in half, cutting in half. It never will actually reach zero. So the half-life is going to be the t to the one half, and that's going to be in seconds or years or what have you. And that's just going to be the natural log of two divided by lambda. Where what lambda really is is it's going to be um, kind of the ratio between the number of decays per second to how long or how many nuclei are kind of left remaining. So let's flip back to the previous page, and this t to the one half is going to be 4.47 billion years for uranium. We're going down into thorium, this one is going to be 24 days, 70 seconds, and so on and so forth. And you can kind of see that if we were to plot this guy right over here, it's going to be a nice, pretty exponential. It's going to decrease, 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 and never actually reach zero. Something else that is of interest is something called the activity, and that's going to be how many decays are occurring per second, or essentially a DNDT, and that's going to be related to lambda, as well as how many nuclei are left. So this guy right over here is called the activity, and you can see this in decays per second. Um, other common units of this guy, you're going to see these guys, one of them is going to be the Curie, which is going to be related to CI. And that's a huge number of decays per second, and that just kind of makes the number slightly more palpable. And if we were to talk about this in the SI unit, it's going to be a Becquerel, named after the fellow I talked about in one of the first slides, and it's abbreviated um, BQ. And essentially one Curie is going to be 3.7 times 10 to the 10th Becquerel, or decays per second. Something else we may also see is going to be T mean, which is just going to be the half-life divided by the natural log of 2. And as I said, this is all kind of prob probabilistic. And we, don't, we can't say that it's going to be exactly 4.47 billion years to go from 1 kilogram to 0.5. It's going to be roughly on average. But it may happen a teeny tiny bit faster. It may ha happen a teeny tiny bit slower. Maybe there's going to be 0.55 or 0.45 kilograms at the half-life. And so we kind of define this mean life right there. So let's take a quick look at um, the activity of cobalt in for example 43.8. Um, we know it's going to decay into iron, and it has a half-life of 272 days. So that is simply going to be T1 half. And what we're looking for is the mean lifetime, so T mean, as well as the decay constant lambda for this guy. And the only thing that's really kind of tricky about um, these activity problems is just paying attention to your units. So always work in, in seconds, and always change your curies into decays per second. So go ahead and convert the half-life from days to seconds. And let's calculate T mean. That's just going to be the half-life divided by the natural log of 2. And it's going to work its way out to 392 days. And this is kind of a mean, um, you know, a, a mean lifetime of this thing. Remember, the half-life is not an exact um, science. Um, go ahead and calculate this decay constant, and that's going to be this, and that is a property of this particular decay, and it's not going to change. So now let's go ahead and play around with activities. Activities are DNDTs, and if we know the activity is two microcuries, or two times ten to the negative six curie, curies, um, how many um, nu um, nuclei does the source contain? So what is N? So we know that DNDT is two microcuries, and again, just pay attention to units, and go ahead and say, uh, let's go ahead and convert this into decays per second. So there it is right over there, two microcuries, just right here. And this is from the previous slide, so um, 7 times 10 to the 4th decays per second. And now we can pretty much go ahead and calculate um, the number of nuclei. And it's going to be 2.5 times 10 to the 12th nuclei using this guy right over here. Now, 
what would the activity be after one year? In order to figure that out, we know that the decay constant is going to stay the same. Uh, all we need to do is know how many nuclei are left after one year. So we can just go ahead and rearrange that exponential as such and realize that it's going to be about 39% of the original nuclei. And if the number of nuclei go down by 39%, so this number right here goes down by 39%, this number doesn't change. This number has to also go down by 39%. So it's going to work its way out to be about 0.788 microcuries. Now, half-lives are also how we can do uh, radiocarbon dating. Um, we know that um, living specimens take in CO2 and they get essentially carbon-14. And carbon-14 has a half-life of about 6,000 years. And once, once the living specimen um, dies, it's no longer taking in carbon-14. And carbon-14 actually decays down into carbon-12. So we could have 14 carbon going down into carbon-12. And again, that takes about 6,000 years. And what we can kind of do is, is we can um, m measure the activity coming out of the specimen, know how much you know, carbon a specimen has, and then we can figure out essentially when something died. Keep in mind that um, because the half-life is 6,000 years, it's very useful for things that are, I don't know, maybe three to 3,000 years to a couple million years old. But at some point, um, we, we reach the limits of radiocarbon dating because something could become so old that it becomes really hard to measure uh, the levels of carbon that are in it. Um, I'll let you take a look at this example um, on your own. Now I just want to talk very briefly about the biological effects of um, radiation. And when we talk about that, you're going to see a couple of units. And I'm not going to press you too hard on these. Um, but you're going to see a rad, which is going to be essentially um, a tenth or uh, a thousandth of a joule per gram, or also known as a gray. And what we kind of have to do is we have to um, kind of talk about radiation and realize that you know different radiation is going to affect us differently. And so we can talk, kind of talk about a biological effectiveness for several types of radiation. And we talked about you know X-rays, electrons, slow neutrons, protons, alpha particles, and heavy ions. You can kind of see, kind of see that the relative biological effectiveness, um, effectiveness gets larger and larger and larger and larger. And essentially, we're talking about how bad some types of radiation are for you. Um, so X-rays, we use those on ourselves. Um, they're really not too awful bad for you compared to things like um, heavy ions. <clears throat> now, let's take a quick look at the sources of radiation exposure um, that we have in our every, everyday lives. Um, keep in mind that the human activity is going to be the orange ones, and medical x-rays or nuclear medicine um, are going to be here, and then consumer products and you know, things like nuclear fallout and stuff like that are going to be in there. So less than 20%. Um, we do have some terrestrial and, and cosmic radiation. Uh, we do have things like radon. Um, now, what do what does radiation do to us? Um, well, it can do some bad things to us. It can break down our DNA if it's um, a really really high exposure level. If it's a mild exposure, we're, we're talking about a sunburn, uh, and it can essentially damage cells and break them apart. Um, that's a that's a bad thing. Um, it can be a good thing. We do use radiation to treat things like cancer, where we're targeting a specific part of the body and trying to essentially destroy the cancerous cells. Um, when we take a look at all these guys right over there, um, it, we're still not talking about a whole lot of radiation. So, you know, don't freak out when you see radon 55%. Um, the book even says if you were to have a house with a high level, level of radon exposure, really, it's, it's going to reduce your... Um, lifetime by about 40 days. We'll compare that to smoking a pack of cigarettes for you know a day. That's going to reduce your life expectancy by six years. So you know, choose your poison. Um, when we even talk about things like nuclear fallout and stuff like that, um, that includes um, an average of um, things like Chernobyl and stuff like that. And we're talking about reducing our lifetime by a day or two at most. So um, yeah. There's worse problems to have. Um, just I want to talk about another um, use of radiation is is we can use radiation, specifically gamma rays, to sterilize and preserve food, and that's a good thing. What it does is it does not damage or harm the food in any way, but it can essentially sterilize it, and that's another good uh, good use of radiation. 
So up until this point, we've been talking about kind of a spontaneous decay, where you know uranium is going to spontaneously decay to thorium. Now let's talk about a nuclear reaction. And essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to um, bombard a slightly unstable particle with another particle and see what comes spitting out. So suppose we had something that was kind of unstable, we'll call that particle A, and we threw particle B at it. And what happens is is particle B hits particle A and particles C and D are kind of formed. Now, essentially the mass difference for the left side and the right side is going to be any energy that is released or that needs to be put, put into the reaction. So we talk about this reaction energy Q, and essentially Q is going to be the mass difference. So it's going to be the mass of A plus the mass of B. And then we're going to subtract the mass of C and the mass of D. And of course, our good friend E is equal to m c squared, where c is, uh, um, where c squared is still our good friend, 931.5 mega electron volts per atomic mass. Now we can talk about whether Q is positive or whether Q is negative, and we're going to talk about exoergic or endoergic reactions. These sound a whole awful lot like exothermic and endothermic, essentially where um, exothermic reactions, you had something that was hot, endothermic it was cold. Probably not surprisingly, that if Q is larger than zero, then heat's going to be released. If it takes Q, if it takes some threshold energy um, for a reaction to occur, then it's going to be a negative Q, so it needs to have some energy added to it. Now, I do want to talk about the two types of nuclear reactions that are nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. And essentially, in nuclear fission, what we're doing is we're taking a really big atom and we're splitting it up into some fragments, which are also known uh, as fragment fission fragments. And they are of comparable mass, but overall, the mass at the end of the day is going to be less, and we have converted some of that mass into energy. Now, if we were to take something, and actually they did this in about the 1938 or so, uh, they had uranium-235, and what they did is, is they bombarded it with a neutron, so 1, 0, and then an N, and then they got radioactive uranium, uranium-236, look at that little star right over there, and this guy is going to break into a couple of different things, it's going to break into barium and krypton and a couple of neutrons, or it could break into um, some other things. But what we essentially found, keep in mind this is a logarithmic scale, is that it's far more likely to produce some things than other things. And you have these kind of bands where um, we, ha we have these two fission fragments, fission fragments, call these guys C and D, and these guys are going to be the product of taking A and B and slamming those guys together. So here we have um, two common reactions for the uranium, or uranium-235, uranium where we go ahead and we add, or ram, a neutron into it, and we get radioactive um, uranium, and it's going to break into barium and krypton, and then actually three neutrons, or xenon and, let's see, that is strontium, strontium as well as two neutrons. And you can convince yourself that there is definitely going to be a mass difference um, from this side of the equation to this side, or this side to this one. And essentially all we're going to do is we're going to say E is equal to del delta m c squared, figure out how much energy is going to be released. Now, keep in mind, these guys are the fission fragments, and if we were to think about it, uranium-235 is huge. Um, and it's going to um, have some nucleides that are not very well bound. I mean, if, if this is going to be uranium-235, we go, go ahead and we spit a neutron into it, and then what's going to happen is it's going to break into two fragments that are a little bit smaller, and a couple of neutrons that kind of come whizzing out. These guys are very strongly bound, and there's going to be a lot of energy released because of that. Um, actually, the book kind of talks with way through about 0.9 mega electron volts per nucleon, and that's a pretty large number. Now we do have a couple models for how atoms are held together by the nuclear strong force, and I didn't really talk about them a whole awful lot, but the, one of the models, the liquid drop model, has a really good explanation for what's going on with fission, and essentially it says we're going to treat a large nucleus um, as something that is positively charged, and we would say, well, electrical forces would tend to cause a repulsion. These guys want to get as far away from each other as possible. 
However, however, surface tension of this liquid drop is holding it together. We know that drops um, have some surface tension to them, and that's kind of like the nuclear strong force. So what we essentially have is we have a barrier to overcome. If we can overcome this barrier, and this barrier is kind of the nuclear strong force, then the electrical forces can take over, and an atom would be able to split. So you know, picture these guys right over there. If you can make it over that hump, then you're good to go. So what's going on with fission is we have this neutron, and we're running it into this nucleus, and it's causing these, this, this guy to start to vibrate back and forth um, very, very rapidly with lots of energy. And as these guys go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, then kind of a neck occurs, and it's just about ready to go over the barrier, just about right there. And then we're going to get two, lo two lobes, and the surface tension, the nuclear strong force, is breaking down, and what's left over is going to be two smaller drops, where they're going to have a much stronger surface tension. And this is just a fission fragment going this direction, this direction, and neutrons kind of going in all directions. Now, we've talked about if we just had one ring atom, but what if we had a whole bunch of them all together in one nice little chamber, and we were to bombard it with neutrons? Well, we might have a chain reaction. So suppose we had a uranium um, 235, and actually we have another name for this. This is sometimes called the mother, and we know that it's going to split into, you know, a couple of different things, and we actually, so let's talk about krypton and barium for, for, for a second. These guys are very often called daughter nuclei, so D-A-U-G-H-T-E-R. We've got a couple of neutrons that kind of come spinning out. Now, if this uranium was close to this uranium, and this neutron happened to hit that one, then it can do the same thing. It can split apart. Um, will it go to krypton and barium? Not necessarily. It might go to ru uh, rubidium and cesium. Um, so we have some more daughter nuclei, so second generation is going like this. We have some neutrons that can run into um, other uraniums. You can kind of see we, that we have just kind of a cascade of um, reactions and also a cascade of energy. Now, kind of a way to think about this, I'm going to show you something from the Harvard National S um, Sciences demonstration. Um, think of this as a bunch of mouse traps with ping pong balls set on them. And what we're going to do is we're going to introduce one neutron. The ping pong balls are kind of the neutrons. And <coughs> what's going on right here is, is we're seeing a chain reaction or a cascade of energy. And there's tons of videos like this up on YouTube. Highly recommend you check them out. It's good fun for, you know, some watching. This, th this essentially is how a nuclear reactor works. We have a bunch of a, a, a um, substance, say uranium, and we go ahead and we put this into a pressure ve vessel in, inside of a core, right? The core is the, the dangerous part, and that's where we have a bunch of radioactive stuff. And we have these control rods that we can essentially slide into or out of this um, reactor core, and it's made out of some, some rods with some heavy metals that can absorb the neutrons. And if we want, you know, a lot of reactions to occur, then we pull the control rods out a little teeny tiny bit. And if we want to slow down the reactions, it's happening too much too fast, or we don't need the energy, then you take the control rods and you push them down into the reactor core, and they're going to absorb all the neutrons, so that chain reaction is going to slow down or even totally stop. Now, the energy release goes into hot water. Hot water goes into right over here, goes into steam at a very high pressure, and that turns the turbine, and we just get electrical power kind of coming out of it. Of course, this does generate a lot of heat, so we have to cool this water off with some other guy right over here. And not surprisingly, most uh, most nuclear power plants are, re are um, located near large water supplies. Um, probably the nearest one to us, I think, would be uh, Lake Anna, um, a little bit south of uh, yeah, a little bit south of here. And the last type of nuclear reaction I want to talk about is actually nuclear um, fusion. And essentially for nuclear fusion, we're taking two light nuclei and we're forming a larger nucleus. However, because we're talking about usually very light nuclei, we're still going to have a larger binding energy per nucleon. So binding energy is going to go up per nucleon. And kind of an example of this is if we were to take two protons and slam them together, then it's going to um, produce deuterion right over here, and it's going to work its way to a helium-3 nucleus. Now keep in mind that some things are kind of coming, coming spinning out throughout this entire process. And eventually it's going to fuse its way together and form itself into a helium nuclei, nu nucleus and a couple of protons or hydrogen atoms that are kind of coming off right over here. Um, so energy is going to be released as this reaction occurs. 
one thing to kind of keep in mind is, is we need to get these two initial protons really, really, really close, like, you know, 10 to the minus 15 meters close, um, in order for the nuclear strong force to take effect. Um, this is hard. Um, the reason or th this only occurs at very, very, very high temperatures, um, so it's going to essentially be happening in our sun. We know our sun is going to burn hydrogen and turn it into helium. This is what's going on with this. Um, again, there's going to be a delta M that's going to give us uh, an energy that is released. And again, delta or E is going to be equal to mc squared. Uh, we are working on methods to achieve cold fusion where we, we don't need large temperatures for this to occur, but we're not quite there yet.